Well, they said they were going to take us on a journey. And you know what? In many ways, I'm just a small town girl living in a lonely world. But Johnny Bairstow fills my heart with something. I think it's warmth. I think it's blood. It's blood going somewhere. Certainly, Root runs, Pope runs, Folks runs, Lease runs, Bairstow. Oh, my God. Young Johnny Bairstow does it again. Hey, Australia's doing some shit over in Sri Lanka. Glenn Maxwell sensational last night. South Africa winning in India. It's India B. Okay, I'll pay you that. I'll have a look at the IPL right still. Five and a half billion. Wouldn't mind a slice myself. Liam Livingston is on the show. Oh, you're going to want to stick around for hashtag AskTGC because somebody's been caught in a lie. This episode is brought to you by Budgie Smuggler. We're getting around Budgie Smuggler for the most ordinary recompetition. A little bit on that later on. And of course, your support makes this show happen at Patreon. Patreon.com forward slash Grey Cricketer if you want to support Da Boys. My name is Ian Higgins, one of Da Boys, and the other Da Boy is Sam Perry. Pez, cricket's happening all around the world, but let's just get into it straight away. Young Johnny Bairstow, YJB, fuck me, that was good. New Zealand is shit. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I mean... And this is the bias of the English press. They're going to spend all their time lauding their own players. But the real story here is that World Test champions have served up dross, right? And there, sh- <laughs> and there needs to be an investigation. Fucking twos. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, mate, that, that was extraordinary from young Johnny Bairstow. And I would like to say yep. on a personal note, just on this show, and I, and I know you've been here before, he goes. It doesn't happen much for Daddy, but da- Daddy was out over the weekend. Uh, yeah. Daddy had a long weekend. Uh, Daddy cup, tipped a couple in. Daddy doesn't get to go out very often, uh, and uh, you know, and he and here we are. So, I, and I just want to say that I just want to say that from the top. I'm not glorifying it or anything like that. I'm just saying it's just that's just where we find ourselves. I'm going to lean and I'm going to lean into it. Ooh, okay. Can you drink talk? responsibly until you get to about 4 to 6 and then start yeah. having a look at some other stuff. Yeah. Anyway, um, but I had a few logistical flight scenarios yesterday which meant I was on a 9:20 p.m. flight from Brisbane to Darwin, landing at 1:05 a.m. in Darwin, and it gave me an opportunity to stay across this game. Uh, in particular, mm-hmm. Bairstow's innings, Stokes's innings to a lesser extent. Uh, mate, I, all I could think watching Bairstow when they tried to start bumping him, mm-hmm. <laughs> when England needed 160 runs after T to win this game. Yeah. Yeah. This, I have never seen somebody in Test cricket do it off their dick more. It, it was, it was like. Yep. It was the definition of doing it off your dick. Like, if anybody has the time and inclination to watch a replay of it, the, mm-hmm. it, the thing that struck me about this innings was the ease of it. It, it was just like, it, it was just, he kept pumping Matt Henry over um, a couple of blokes out in the boundary into that short one, yeah. uh, 20 rows yeah. back uh, at yeah. um, Trent Bridge there. But, like, mate, he was just slapping, dashing, flicking. Uh, yeah. He had his ham and cheese toasty at tea time and a cup of coffee, yeah. and he was just doing his best, though, thing. Uh, I, I don't know where to start with it, mate. Three, is, what sort of test win is this? I, I mean, Stokes has come out and said this blows away the test wins at Headingley uh, and the World Cup. This is my best ever win as an England player. Uh, yeah, it's not, though, is it? It's not. I mean, don't make don't make me go straight in. New Zealand were fucking dog shit in this game. <laughs> Embarrassing. The third innings of this game. What the fuck were they doing? And then, okay, you made me, you made me go into. They've got, I, I, got I a just, debut. I just they've got, I just they've cast got debut, out the rod. <laughs> they've got, they've got, you've got you've got seven slips and you've got a wide and a half volley. I'm gonna have a look at it. They've got a debutante spinner who's probably played his last test with respect. Um, Jamison can't bowl in the, sec- in the fourth innings of the game. I mean, ha- how New Zealand lost this game? I mean, come on. I mean, come on. I mean, do- this don't get ahead of yourself. This was this was twos, threes. Are you talking That's to what Stokes this game was. Me? I don't know who I'm talking yeah. to anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, Stokes and Bearsoat were so good. It's it's such a good win. 
Don't, don't get carried away. Let's not. Come on. Come on. What about, it's a really good, important win. Uh, firstly, about, it's actually more important, I think, though, mate, that they've actually scored 539 the first innings because in the last, like, 10 years, England just don't get more than 250. That is really, really good. And the, the run chase... Fucking sensational. And in the 18 months previous where it's been so grim for England cricket fans, to have a win like this where they've got um, day five yeah. uh, free pe- free entry to yeah, the ground, all yeah, that shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, tw- 12 and a half thousand people, not many if I'm honest, uh, in, a, in a population of 70 million, but you know, it's cute. Um, it's a really good win and an important win. But fucking come on, New Zealand, dreadful. Absolutely fucking dreadful. Ah. <sighs> <laughs> Mate, Southie couldn't bowl. He couldn't fucking land the thing. What about uh, making what about making five fifty plus on the first innings and yeah. at that moment and losing in time comfortably. going? Yeah. <laughs> what about we'll set him three hundred uh yeah. and it being reeled in in fifty overs on the fifth day of a test match? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What is that? Uh, I mean what you say has mm-hmm. to be at least partially true, doesn't it? Like it's like <laughs> just, it, it cannot well, yeah. be. Un- it, it, and look, we're just playing our role as Australians, aren't we? Like, it, it sure refuse to like deliver the accolades to this game that many will try and deliver. <laughs> One, you yeah. Know, it, it, it like it's, it's mate, uh, yeah. It's got false dawn written all over it. It's got false dawn written all over it. I'm, like it was a really good win, a really good win. It's more than good. I mean, you still got to do it. Like, like, like. Hey, I mate, reckon oh, what man, I would and, say, and would, and will say about England, fantastic. mate. Yeah. Like, no one does the fucking Tamasha, like momentum shit with the bat like England at home. Yeah. Like when you know. Yeah. People are putting those fucking side by side things of best of um, Stokes hitting the winning runs at Headingley in here, and that's obviously mm. sending me into a fucking a sending me apoplectic yeah, conniption. and conniptions <laughs> and in fetal position all at once. Um, hell of a medical issue I've got there. <laughs> that um, is quite. I get that. Is that but there is a fever there. going around as well, uh, and yeah, uh, so right. it could, could be that. Uh, so and, and you know when they get that roll on going, that's a. Yeah. Um, that's a pretty cool thing that they've got, England. Like, you know, if we're going to do, yep. you know, comparison is the thief of all joy, and that's what cricket is as well. Uh, I, like, I, I, I don't see Australia creating those kind of moments, you know, with the bat. We don't, we don't have that mentality. I think it is a no. bit of a win for mentality, you know, and the McCullum style and all that kind of stuff. But they have guys that can just destroy you if they if they're in the right mood and things go their way but i think it's funnier to talk about new zealand being (laughs) dog shit there is no doubt a change of mentality i see this perhaps more so than any other player than with alex lease who has hit 67 in the um in the in the second sorry in the in the first innings and then he got he got a very brisk 40 um, in the second dig, and he looks like a much freer player. So I, I, I see that very pronounced image change of mentality. And I agree with you. Australia don't have the six and seven to execute what Bairstow and Stokes did in this game because they are such phenomenal white ball players and they play in the white ball manner. And just, and just Stokes on a day five chasing, he's a bigger wicket than Root somehow. You know, it just, it just feels like... You know, um, Stokes' test average is 35. He's got 11 test hundreds. Joe Root's now got um, 87 test hundreds in the last six weeks. Um, but it just feels like it, this is just – Stokes is just such a match play guy. Like, he's just – give me the runs required with the balls left, and I'll just – I'll create an environment where I'm just going to do this quite easily. And then some of the some of the sixes to, um, you know, accompany Bearstow's slogs of Bracewell and, and Henry – slogs is a harsh term um, – like when he's just running down the wicket to Southie, especially, and just hitting him straight over his head, it's like fucking. They, 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 you're not like the game was over. When Bersa got his hundred, they still needed like eighty to win. It was over, but he celebrated like I've won the game. It, it was, was over. It was done. It was over, uh, except when Bersa got out, and then Folks was dropped without fourteen to win, and then you realise that Matt Potts is in next, and then there's um, Broad, Anderson, and Leach. No, so I still feel like New Zealand might have better chance, <laughs> but like. Yeah. But that actually makes it even more remarkable. I mean, 136 of 92 balls in day five of a test match. It was a flatty, to be fair. Um, actually just goes to show how Daryl Mitchell uh, was mad of the match because he got 190, uh, 60, dropped a few catches and ran two blokes out in the third innings. Mm. So I thought he was actually the most influential uh, guy in the test match. 60, for me. 60 not as well. 
and like oh, sorry, Rennick, and, Rennick, and in that Rennick. in that not out, <laughs> the tail was kind of swinging, and and Daryl Mitchell was he was playing quite circumspect manner as well. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah I think yeah. that's a beautiful return for Daryl Mitchell yeah. coming off the back of a hundred <laughs> as well. Like you got to yeah, remember yeah. that Daryl Mitchell was no cer- average, no certainty to play in this series as well. So can you just no, imagine no. how? <laughs> euphoric he would feel in the dressing room this time around you know like you know do you remember in school like the best laugh you can have is the suppressed one it's the one you're not allowed of course, to have yes of course that that's daryl mitchell but euphoria in the change room just like yeah he, he, he can you know because it obviously you lose the game so your head has to drop you have to look at the floor now um, yeah, to, to right. feign your disappointment while you're thinking about the circuit and if there's a few beers around or whatever, um, mm-hmm. and ever maybe maybe senior players say something or whatever to the team, and maybe Daryl Mitchell like he's probably not got that position in the side yet, but he's probably scored enough runs that he could just speak for maybe 25 mm. seconds longer than he should, you know, like yep. 20, maybe 20. Mm-hmm. That's a long time, but maybe 20 mm-hmm. seconds longer, like he's about to finish his little piece about. Um, execution and valuing your wicket and it and he just adds another clause and another clause after that and just something about the deck as well and what they should do at training mm. that that's mm. what those runs gain you and that is uh, that's invaluable yeah, that's yeah. more than I any think, central mm. contract oh yeah yeah i think just a little phrase something like we're a better team than this like yeah. sort of elevating like myself as quite a senior figure in the side despite me playing 11 test matches so far i speak actually, on behalf of the actually, collective <laughs> <laughs> he's got he's got like 300s and like and I think four fifties in his eleven tests, so that's it's a fucking he pretty great time. Like an he can play. He's an excellent. He's an excellent T Twenty player as mm. well. Um, but yeah, just something, something like that. Something like, come on, boys, we can do better than this. Yeah. What we we've served up, or uh, maybe so like what sort of other thing? Like, like I'd like to see us um, do a few extras at training. You know what I mean? Or yeah, would it, you know, mm-hmm. any, like w- would it kill a couple of the boys to get there earlier or whatever? Just little things that we can all improve. And start talking about little things. <laughs> I like the idea of like international training blokes are still lobbing up. Yeah, like they, right, yeah. yeah. I'll get there when I can. Yeah. I yeah. mean, that's what those kind of runs afford you. That's more than any extension on your house or any car or any, um, you know, private tuition for yeah. your child, born or unborn. Yeah. Down on the I mean, both list. are nice, to be fair. They're nice yeah. in their own way. They're all their own yeah. investments. Yeah, we will be talking about the IPL right still in a moment's time. In a time. moment. Um, so Tom Blundell also scored some runs, 106. He obviously got 96 there over at uh, Lords. Um, so that was good, 543, 553. This is after Ben Stokes decided they'd have a bowl first. Um, so, you know, Bezo sort of got him out of jail there. <laughs> um, and then England got 539, uh, and Ollie Pope got his first 100 in England, his oh, first yeah. 100, batting at number three, 145. Oh, those were some sexy-looking runs. The stability, more chance to, um, you know, have a look at Ian Bell, uh, montages, just comparisons, that kind of shit. Um, it was masterful, and he got out on 145 with a, a relatively loose shot, I suppose. But it gave him an opportunity to show his disappointment walking off the field, more hugs from Joe Root. Um, again, when is cricket good? Famous question uh, here on the show. But uh, 145, uh, a very, very good innings from Ollie Pope. Actually, he was dropped. He was dropped. I was going to say perfect. So it wasn't perfect, but it was, um, fuck, it was pretty good. It was pretty good, and that's and that's a really important one for this single yeah, team. I reckon scratchy early, so that probably take that's yeah. actually not a hundred anymore. So he, I, yeah. I, 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 I know yeah, there was right, a few yeah. pundits, a few pundits saying like he didn't look that good early. It's like ah, oh, a number three bat not looking good that like <laughs> a number three bat not <laughs> yeah, having it all yeah. their own way yeah. <laughs> against Trent Bolt and Tim <laughs> yeah. Southey. That's yeah. literally in the England, game. Yeah, yeah in yeah. England, um, yeah. somehow yeah. gets through it to make hundred and forty five. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. actually. Look, this was just Not a perfect clip, though, and I don't, um, I don't actually know what happened after this. But I did know, like the BBC um, TMS, they put out really good clips of the of what the commentators say after dismissals and stuff. Really good. Well, clip. Um, and uh, I think Alison Mitchell, upon Ollie Pope reaching his hundred, spoke really well and asked her co-commentator Alastair Cook while she was kind of celebrating and bringing in this hundred, you know, is this Ollie Pope cementing his place in the side? She kept talking and it was Alistair Cook's point, uh, turn to talk and he's like, he's played well today. Uh, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> um, he may have said some yeah. ni- nicer words afterwards. Uh, but yeah, mate, obviously, you know, Joe Root's got some runs as well. That's just, everyone's getting hundreds in this game. If you didn't get a hundred, you're in trouble. But this is what I want to say. Um, yeah. People are still out for Zach Crawley. 
they've got mm. to stick with Zach Crawley. They just have to stick with him. And when you um, win games like this, it just buys guys like him a little bit more time. There's no one sure. else in the ranks of England cricket who should take that spot. He'll come good, Zach Crawley. Uh, maybe opening's not his position. I don't know. But he's a fucking gun. And um, he'll do something like that down the track as well. I agree, I do. I agree, mate. I do agree. Though, how many... T- like, is it actually... When does it become detrimental to the guy's longer-term career when you keep him in the side when he is consistently underperforming. Now, I, 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 now I agree with you. As, uh, both can be true. I think he is the best option, and I think he's a fucking gun, and I think he's going to be good. And batting, opening the batting in England is fucking really hard. It's just um, a prediction. I'm saying I, I think he will come good. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, how long? Yeah, sure, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I, I think somebody like him with his talent uh, and ability and uh, what's like his ceiling, mm. I guess – in the current environment, in the strap yourself in, buckle up for the ride, Rob Key environment, um, Brendan yeah. McCullum sneakers, sockless sneakers environment, um, face yep. salad, sort of aviator style thing, sitting and not moving on the mm-hmm. balcony environment. Yep. I um, I think Zach Crawley will, uh, he should be given more time than the average person because I think he'll repay it. Um, I agree. Um, he... His 267 against Pakistan accounts for 23% of his entire test match runs so far. Stat dog, woof, woof. Also another stat in this game, Pez. Most boundaries ever hit in any test match in the history of the <laughs> fucking sport. Wow. That's how many boundaries were. I'm it's, surprised. It's like, 200, it's like 270 boundaries, fours and sixes in really? this game. Just in the, you know what, what boundaries are, fours and sixes, mate. Oh, is that um, right? Yeah, most ever in any test match. I say maximum. Isn't that amazing? Um yeah. I thought the record would be in India for that because I swear I've watched Australia get pumped around the ground in India. Just balls just going, <laughs> going, going through a gully for four. Yeah. Well, I mean, talking about the flatness of the deck, there is one anomaly uh, in this game. Uh, five, 553 played, 539 played, 284 all out played, 300 for five. Um, so uh, New Zealand have lost this game by some really weird batting in that third innings. Um, but, you know... Uh, I don't even even then, Bairstow's innings was fucking sensational. That also that means he's got he's got a, he got a hundred in Sydney, he got a hundred in the Caribbean. He's now got a hundred in the second test here. He's on a he's in a really rich train. I think that's eight or nine. It might be his ninth test hundred. I think it is. Um, so fuck, that's pretty good. And that means Josh Butler will never play test cricket again. Um, or some shit. Or does that mean Josh um, Butler comes back? Like, he's, if England's just playing freewheeling gear and everyone... Like, Moeen Ali's mm. unretired himself now. He's actually said, I've officially unretired myself. Adi mm. Orshid wants to come back. Like, the Globetrotters want to get back together again. You know? Like, is this... Is, like, does Josh Butler go, no, I'll, I'll be able yeah. to play under McCullum as well. Is, I'll be able to play in the strap yourself in buck up for the ride environment as well. Or is Ben Folks too attractive now, um, do the gloves look, is it too mm. neat? Is the balance nice? Is well, it, is I gotta no say, room? is it the no Joss club? Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, Ben Folks has kept very well in this game. He's also scored 50 in the first dig. He's got 12 not out in the end here, uh, in the, in the fourth dig, but, um, he's wearing those black gloves and he also did try to run out Mitchell off Stuart Broad by underarming the ball at the stumps. And that is a huge demerit point in my marks really? uh, in terms of the neatness of what you care. But yeah, it was fucking village. Um, because Mitchell was like this is in the this was in the in the first innings and Mitchell was like batting out of his crease to broad to try and negate LBW, and I think he just like let one go outside of stump. Folks just had a shot at the stumps. Um, just real sloppy shit, and that's that's it's really let me down in the neatness because I think he's potentially the best wicket keeper in world cricket. His gloves are that good for me. Um, and it's just hey, I mean it's it's obviously just it's cover models for days. Um, I mean he could he could walk catwalks if that's what he wanted to do. Um. But, but that, that kind of stuff can get right in the bin. Um, anything else from this game? Pez, I suppose New yes. Zealand, uh, they had to make several changes. Uh, Kane Williamson was out with COVID. It's just at the top. Uh, Colin de Gronholm done his heel. Uh, obviously, Jamison couldn't bowl in the fourth innings, and he looks like he'll be out of the tour. He's got some tightness in his back. Mm. They played Bracewell instead of Patel. Um, and, yeah, so I thought, it's... Um, um, I, thought Mark, good. I thought Bracewell looks good, actually, especially with the bat. He just looks like a good cricketer, but then Bairstow just destroyed him deluxe, uh, made him look like yeah. he was fours. Uh, in, yep. But he sort of made everyone look like that. And what's the other non important thing I want to say? Yeah, bit. he looked really good with the, with the mm. blade. Um, oh, this is not important at all, but... Um, Everyone obviously wanking over Joe Root, as as they probably should. I saw articles sort of lauding. Hell yeah, 
lauding 10 runs that he made on the third morning because he flipped somewhat over over um over the slips um so there's yeah. a whole article about that uh but i suppose you would do that if he's scoring all your runs but just in that fourth innings there when it was all looking pretty um dicey for england after he was out caught and bowled he he he, he stared at that wicket for a very long time just notice that mm. you know like for, for, for a guy that's ostensibly yeah. a lovely person no one's got a bad word to say about him you know mm. The length of time you stare at the wicket after being dismissed is directly in proportion to how much of a, you know, you likely are. As we've always said. I was saying boo <laughs> <laughs> What the fuck? It's fucking, it's fucking triple M now. <laughs> I can't see you doing that. Oh, very good. Wow, yeah, it's just something okay. came in mind. It's just something came in mind. Yeah, no. Hey, Pez, um, um, yep. there's, there's more test cricket to come for Joe Root, um, if selected. If selected. Um, there's obviously another game against this very strong New Zealand side, uh, World Test Champions. And then they've got South Africa, obviously. And then, later in the year, they go into those very spicy decks in Pakistan, uh, where some blokes have managed to find a winkle out a couple of runs there. So Joe Root is looking like finishing the year 2022 with about 37 test hundreds. Um, it's our 10 test hundreds since 2021 in that time Williams from zero Coley zero Steve Smith zero test hundreds um, so that's fucking amazing uh, so so a year and a bit ago Joe Root had 17 test hundreds and now he's got 27 yeah, equal, with, right. uh, with, equal with Smith and Coley fucking unbelievable run unbelievable and the fact he's not um, even remotely in the picture of a player of the game is because Bearso's innings was just one of the best things anyone's ever seen uh, on a flatty, he uh, got a bit lucky. I thought um, on a flatty sort of against quite a slow start. Yeah, I think uh, it was. I think it was. I think it was ten off twenty five early. So yeah. So a mm, couple of caveats there. Couple of caveats. What do you say um, he goes to Australians who will refuse to um, acknowledge the superiority of Joe Root until he dominates our own country? Of which I'm not one of those people. Well, they'd be right. So, I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't see what the, I don't see what the problem yeah, yeah, yeah. is. Yeah, no, me too. <laughs> Until he does it on the fucking Gabba. Um, he, uh, I want to know. I want to know his. I need to know more about his record, like home and away. But then batting in England is probably the hardest. Yeah, you know, India's hard as well. Maybe everywhere's hard in international cricket. I could see him on uh, home and away. <laughs> Incidentally, <laughs> with my brother's keeper across his chest here, because um, that was a bra boy in my mind. <laughs> it's a niche reference. <laughs> Joe Root is a bra boy on Home and Away. I thought we were talking about Joe Root on Home and Away, not his Home and Away record. IMDb, um, mate. He he's he's just the best. He's just the best test batter by a fucking mile. Uh, at the moment At the moment um, At the moment But who's the uh, Isn't it great There's just two conversations Who's the best test batter And who's the best test batter At the moment Well a year ago I mean a year and a bit ago He wasn't, he wasn't the best was he And now he is oh, And man. he has been For the last last 18 months 140 so, years ago WG Grace was the best bat In the world Was he Yeah but we saw Yeah <laughs> but It was actually This little known guy um, Playing in Harare mm. Um Named Doctor Zayas. I still, mate. Um, I, saw, I saw one clip of WG Grace. He was he was quite coordinated off the hip. It's, when, it's better than what it's better it's, than I want it to be. It's a shame. Yeah. yeah. But the but the but the, the still photos are like, what the fuck is this? I would have been amazing if I played in eighteen forty. Wouldn't it be the most disappointing thing? Like if you got to go back in time, like like to eighteen forty. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> mate, I would have done that in France. <laughs> like, <laughs> If you could have time travel, and we've all we all believe that we'd play Test cricket if we started in eighteen nineties, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you yeah, went down yeah, to yeah, grade yeah, yeah. training in the eighteen nineties yeah. in your full in your full length whites and your top hat, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, uh, with a fucking belt as a rope, a red right. rope as a belt, rather, belt as a rope. Or, or, you, or you went in your grade training gear, and that actually is what made you the leper. You went to the third net, but like imagine if you did, <laughs> yeah. and they were actually better than you, like ones players, or just working you, working you down the ground and through. <laughs> Mate, it's like um. You know when you you see like um like the old the like like the old footballs that they play with in like the nineteen thirty two World Cup or whatever and like the old boots and stuff and they're yeah. playing in like 
you know, like long, like long johns. Yes. And it's like, how the fuck were they so athletic still? Like, so yeah. there's been no chance. If I'm shit with all the, you know, air, air you know, the, all the technology now, then uh, I'm absolutely no well, chance. Mate, exactly. Of uncovered it's, wickets. It's still the same principles that apply. You know, you've got to be thick. You've got to have a thick face, thick mitts, mm. thick body all around, and you'll be fine. It's just genetics. Yeah, but d- don't hasn't some like uh, geneticist figured out that like Samson, as in the Bible, was only like five seven, because <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because everyone was everyone was smaller then. Mike Tyson's short, you know. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, and that is England <laughs> Sam- being two 0 up. Samson yeah. versus Mike Tyson. Who would win? Shark versus tiger. <laughs> Will a boy ever be born? <laughs> They can swim faster than a shark. All right, um, Sri Lanka and Australia, Pez. So I was to go from the top here because there's been a three T20I series, yeah. uh, which Australia won 2-1, won and then Australia series. played their first ODI game last night, mate, which I am just fucking just salivating for this one. Just a, a, a bilateral ODI series in Sri Lanka. Mm. Uh, that's what gets me off. Um, so Australia won the first T20 game by 10 wickets. They chased down 130 or some shit. Warner and Finch got the job done. Um, they won by three wickets in the second game, um, and I suppose, and in the third game, they um, they conceded they conceded fifty nine of the last three overs, I think, yeah. to lose that game. Yeah, to conspire to lose that game. Hmm, match fixing. Wow, that that a hell of a um, word. <laughs> so, uh, the main conversation we were talking about beforehand this series was uh, Aaron Finch. Um, and he has got some runs. There's been some Finch runs. He got 61 not out in the first game, 24 and 29. He got 44 last night in the ODI. But actually, to be fair, he looked better last night. He did look better last night. But um, those those three scores, four scores, if you include the ODI on that game as well, in that run as well, rather, then that's it's it's good. It's good. Just feel like, I mean, you can tell we're at the end. It's just, it's just how long the end uh, uh, mate, uh, is away. I think like the end uh, end is away. If someone's in a major form slump and then they get out of it to once again contribute, then you have to hand that to them, like in and of themselves, like or in and of itself. But mm-hmm. I I agree, I agree with you. Like, uh, why do I get the feeling that um, the conversation around Finch will f- for his supporters and like I I appreciate people who want to support Aaron Finch as well. He's a great person. He's He's, Hell yeah, he, he deserves a lot of support from people for what he's um, I done for the team and how much he's respected. It's just I get the feeling the conversation's going to become that it's okay that he does enough, you know. Like so, mm. and, and and maybe I'm just greedy because I'm like, yeah, but I want I want my opening bat to like destructively win us a game every so often, you know, because it's the yeah. Australian team. They should all have the capacity to go and. Um, to go and really win you the game, but I feel like with Finch, it's yeah, like, no, if, he, if he doesn't, if he does enough, it's going to be okay. Um, so Australia's going to need a couple of other guys to really go next level. But I'm probably shifting the goalposts, aren't I? Like he's got himself out of a form slump. It seems where he literally couldn't get the ball for square, and now he's doing enough. So maybe, maybe it's the next step. Perhaps. Um, tell you what, Josh Hazewood is fucking the king at the moment in yeah. uh, with as in terms of a seamer in, in T20 cricket. Obviously, he's had his pretty pretty sensational um, IPL. He took four for 16 in the first T20. He got none for 16 in the second game. Um, he is consistently economical and consistently taking poles, though he did just take none from that second game that I just um, highlighted. They went none for 16 off four overs. Pretty good, in my opinion. Um, he he is just an absolute jet. He's a gun. He's a fucking bush horse. Um, and he is Australia's first, well, his first bowling name in the team sheet. Um, in fact, he actually might be Australia's, he actually might be Australia's best T20 player at the moment. I mean, Warner's pretty good. But Hazelwood actually might be Australia's best T20 player at the moment. Would that be right? Samp is good as well. No, I reckon Hazelwood might be. I think he's the best performed in the IPL, if that's what we're going off, like in, in the sure. last year or two. Um, Glenn Maxwell's mm. a pretty good player as well. True, uh, true. But, um, yeah, that's right. I, I did notice last night actually watching the ODI a little bit. Um, one of the Sri Lankan openers, like, just sort of swiped Hazelwood off a length over mid-wicket for four. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Brad Haddon in his commentary, and he, had, he does, he's a good commentator, Brad Haddon, I think. I like his insights. He's, he's really no, He knows cricket at a good level of detail, and at especially technical detail. Mm-hmm. But, you know, one of the problems when you have such a wonderful eye as Brad Haddon had, I tend to find with commentators, is it's just 
they can speak in simplifi- with a level of simplification that um, others sure. that, that we can't really relate to. So he said he said something to the effect of like, "Well, sometimes that's sometimes Josh Hazelwood's length can be his undoing. All you have to do is just stay still." Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. so if you just stay still here. If you stay still, we can get under him. All right, he should actually. Bro- he'd make a lot of yeah. money saying that to a lot of other IPL teams because obviously not a lot of bats are staying still. Mate, I um I often found that if a coach just told me to watch the ball, mm. um things would get a little bit easier. Yep, things would get a little. But bit what easier. about as JL says? What if you watch it like a hawk? I actually haven't checked if hawks have good eyesight. Mm. I think they do. I think they do. But also, if you just want it a bit more, that can also go quite a long way. Mm. Um, just just really wanting something. Um, sort of takes religion out of the equation for the most part, given prayers and whatnot. But, um, yeah, I, I, if you sort of go into a game and you just want it a bit more than your position, mm. then... Well, that's a good point. I mean, that actually is true, in, especially in twos. Um, ha- but professional cricket is probably a little bit more even. Well, let's face it. No one's going to remember a fucking thing about these series. Um, but I'm like, yeah. so happy for, uh, but happy for Sri Lankans in a, whose country's in a state of um, turmoil, deep turmoil. Uh, and yep. I wanted to say that the the aesthetic of like a of a night white ball international match in Sri Lanka is not one that mm. I've seen a lot of, and I fucking no. and, I, and I liked the energy and the vibe of it. Um, oh, mate, pack, going, pack stadiums in yeah, Cairns in Colombo. Going yep. hard. And, like, look, yeah. th- there's energy issues there, which probably um, contributes to the dimmer light that you see. But the dimmer light also then um, that they're literally playing under, that then harks back to, like, scarier times watching, say, the Socceroos against, like, Argentina in 1993, you know, in a World Cup qualifier. Respect to the it's Socceroos, fun. obviously. Uh you know when, like, you know when you were younger, turning on like SBS to watch Australia or some other game that was played in Central Europe or something like that, and it's just, mm. the footage is just a, just a little bit grainy and everything's just a little mm. bit scary and the sounds from the crowd are just a little bit foreign to you, you know. Yeah. Uh, yep. I just got a little bit of that 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 vibe with Sri Lanka and I liked it. Yeah, I liked it, especially just when the they won. Energy in the energy in the stadium of a you know Montevideo, for instance, just mm. a little bit scarier because yeah. yep. I don't really know the political situation there, yep. and I'm just a little bit scared of it. Mm. Also, just some, um, yeah, I just, it's a little bit, little bit darker in the air. The, mm. the lights aren't working. There's just a That's bit right. more electricity. That's electricity right. I don't yeah, like, really understand. Yeah, like um, like Alvaro Recoba and like Dario Silva are running at your player, <laughs> Lucas Neal. They were so good. you know, like you, like but, so, yeah, but yeah, something yeah, about yeah, a real yeah. like a good player, Lucas Neal, obviously. Yeah. But like uh. Yeah. Brett Emerton. So, yeah, something like like a, just something like a real Anglo name. When you've grown yeah, yeah. up like in Australia Craig with more. That's right. That's a better example. That's right. Um, yeah, like when you're growing up in Australia, at when we in the early nineties, where like the Serie A and like you know it, it, Italian football was kind of the um, creme de la creme of football. You just like yeah, when when you know Craig Moore from Northern Spirit. He's just trying to um, stay <laughs> yeah. shoulder to shoulder with with Dario Silva, you know, uh, with that grainy yeah. footage. It's four a.m. Hey, you've had a big night. Uh, yeah, that can be scary. <laughs> hey. hey, 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 hey! I got the Sunday scaries or Monday for a long weekend. Hey, celebrating mm. the coin. Um, yeah. Uh, so uh, so Australia won the first ODI, which was last night. Sri Lanka made three hundred, uh, and then there was uh, they lost six overs. Due to rain, uh, and Australia chased down two hundred and eighty-two for eight with nine balls remaining. Um, a few guys contributed. Uh, Finch got forty. Stoin is actually batted really nice. He got forty mm. off about thirty balls, and then Steve Smith got fifty as well. Run a ball, batting at three. But then Maxwell came in, batting at seven, and it's fucking. It, it, it was it was peak Maxwell. It was doing everything. Eighty not out of fifty-one, batting at seven. Australia had no right to win this game by the end, but he he was unbelievable, Maxwell. This is on uh, Hasarango has actually had a really good series in both yeah, the T twenties and the player. and the ODI. He, he's a really good player. Yeah, um, obviously had a good season at RCB and uh, scored runs in this game as well. I think he hit Jai Richardson for five fours in a row in the second last over, um, and uh, he took four for Hasarango. He looks he looks very he looks very hard to play. Um, mm. in, on a number of different services. So he's good. But anyway, Maxwell just took him to town as well. Um, and so 80 of 51 seeds for Glenn Maxwell. Fucking hell. That's that's the kind of power that Australia... Oh, mm, mate, Tim David in that side with Stoinis and Maxwell. You're getting some power there. I want to see Tim David in. That's just what I want. That's what I want, mate. 
and Mitch Marsh at three. There's power. That's that's a, it's a really powerful Australian team that I haven't really seen before. Though you know Australia, the current um, world champions mm. in the T20 format, but I okay. still feel like I think Australia would be good. I think Australia well, could I, be good. Um, I think a few things to say about that. Like it feels like like Maxwell eighty or fifty. Like there's a, you know. Uh, cricket hipsters or those who are like real connoisseurs of the game probably known this for a long time but that kind of innings is like a new normal right like Maxwell will miss out like he might miss out three or four times but yeah. then, then yeah. he'll do that and for do you that. you know yeah. that's kind of how these guys operate so um, chatting with Liam Livingston later it was just me uh, and uh, let him say it but he talks about that as well like just understanding that like phew, yeah, it's probably mm. not going to come off most of the time uh, but then yeah. you know but then it does and it's great Uh Mate, I totally see. I totally agree with what you're saying about Tim David. I, I like. I don't understand why he appears to be nowhere near the Australian team, and mm. I go back to Watto's comments on our show a few weeks ago. Mm. I was an IPL show um, where he was kind of pressed, like we pressed him on why Tim David, who Watto would see a lot in the IPL, doesn't get. A star, mm. and he indicated though he's got no. I don't, Watto doesn't have any skin. Oh, it was just his opinion. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But he said he needs to engage with the with the first class system more. I found mm. that really interesting. You know, it, if that's true, I think that's um, that's got a lot of implications. You know, I wonder, and this is just this is pure speculation. You know, with, mm. with no journalistic merit. But like, I yeah, wonder. Let's go, let's go with it though. I I, yeah. I wonder if. There is an abiding philosophy at Cricket Australia or with the ACA at the moment that, like, if they permit more of these um, freelancers, if you want to call them that, who don't, pl- you know, go and train with the state team to play for Australia, that that will be a signal to a number of other players that they don't have to engage with, you know, the um, legacy Australian cricket as much. And as such, you know, Tim David is... Uh, on the outer from the Australian system or the Australian team at the moment. And I, and I, I think that's extraordinary with where cricket's going and also to yep. potentially, not that they've done it yet and they might pick him, but to potentially deny the Australian public one of um, the best players in the world at the moment. And again, I don't want to foretell too much about Liam Livingston's chat, but he speaks very highly of Tim David. He's playing with him at the moment at Lancashire and Liam Livingston's yep. probably the most destructive player in the world at the moment. Uh, that's really interesting to me, you know. Mm. Um, anyway, we're saying this in the context of Australia running down 300, so they're doing okay for the moment. But ahead of a World yeah, Cup, yeah, yeah. could they be better? But, mate, isn't, isn't that interesting that what, what England to revolutionise the white ball game in, in ODI cricket, and first and foremost, and then secondly in T20I cricket, um, obviously they haven't won a World Cup just yet with it, but they'll be in the mix um, come later in the year in Australia, that if you – like, often – the guys who chase, when the team's chasing, one guy needs to come off. And if you've got eight guys who can go at fucking 150, yeah. that's why Joe Root didn't get picked in the team anymore because he was sort of going at like sort of 110, 120. Mm. Mm. And that's that, that role isn't really required anymore. It's the same thing why Steve Smith is struggling to um, really perform in T20 cricket for Australia and why he hardly played in the IPL as well is because like he hasn't quite got that... Um, that gear shift in him mm. just yet. So if you've got seven guys, I mean, the West Indies do this as well. They're a very, very destructive team. If you've got these kind of players who can just go from the beginning, one one guy comes off and you're going to go pretty close to winning a lot of games. You get two mm. guys and then it's game over. You're going to score sort of 210, 220. Um, so that does seem to be the shift in where cricket is going and T20 cricket is going. And then it also comes off in um, there, so hitting 130 off 70 balls in a test match. Um, and then just chasing 300 on day five against, um, against uh, I think it was Canterbury twos. So I think that's who played. Um, anything else, person Australia, Sri Lanka? I, I don't... You tell me if you want to just raise this another time, but he's talking about like you know Tim David and Australia's lower order, which also includes Matt Wade. Um, you know, mm-hmm. a, a, just a nice segue into general hurricane stuff uh, and and how they might be thinking about uh, their team into in the future <laughs> and whether Wade. And Do you want Tim to talk David about that now? Home. Well, I, I, you know, we're sort of in the air, we're in the ballpark in the area. Yeah, we're in the ballpark. Oh, yeah. okay, oh, you died. Okay. Or oh, do you want to do that? Do you want to? Do you want to? Leap? Do you want to get through the cricket first? Uh, no, let's talk about it right now. So what Pez is alluding to there is Ricky Ponting's got a new role at the Hobart Hurricanes. Now, it's been suggested that um, that he has he has Justin Langer's phone number. Uh, I believe that is the case. And uh, JL, uh, well, this is out of work just an allegation. Moment. Yeah, uh, he's out of work at the moment. Uh, and uh, there looks like there might be a coaching change there at the, at the Hurricanes. 
Um, Matt Wade's the captain of that franchise, and um, uh, it, uh, he might not be captain of this year. He might, he might, he might oh, find really? himself in a different franchise. Uh, you know, maybe. Um, Tim David's also there, and that's that's also an interesting one. Um, but that's uh, yeah, it's interesting. That's interesting. So it, it it emerged last week, I think, that uh, Ponting has taken on a strategy role at the strategy Hurricanes, role. which means he's able to appoint the coach and the and maybe advise like the head on, of- on the list or some shit. Yeah, which which Tim Payne has been looked he's, he's looking at as like yeah, the head of the Tim. roster or some yeah, and like uh, head of he, the roster. What's that? Head of the roster. <laughs> not to be confused with Rooster. Um, yeah, the new Top Gun movie. And if that or is head of the an, river, if if the new Top Gun movie isn't an allegory for um, grade cricket, I'm fucking not here. Mm. No, grade cricket sort of about 15 years ago. Anyway, um, it's literally someone <laughs> called Rooster. But anyway, um, <laughs> it's just a fucking the whole thing is an alpha cock show, yeah. and I loved it yeah. every minute. But um. Yeah, like reading Ponting's comments and also mm-hmm. grapevine stuff. Like it looked to be a pretty decent uh, softening of the ground for the arrival of, um, you know, just the former lady, Australian the, coach, the, the, the great well, the former <laughs> Australian coach JL, and uh, and soon after, soon after that emerged, uh, Matt Wade made some. I think lukewarm comments about uh, so Matt Wade's a ha- captain of the Hobart Cur- Hurricanes. Lukewarm mm. comments about um, Langer uh, and his time in the Australian side, saying, "Well, that's the, you know he he got this feedback saying that you know his style. I don't know if his style is going to be different. Blah 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 blah. We're going to have to see. We're going to have to cross that bridge when we come to. It. I don't even know if what Wade's deal is at the Hurricanes, but um, you know there's a few suggestions floating around that you know if if one comes in, the other the other goes, uh, and and if. Uh, and that maybe there's other players who might feel the same way, um, but yeah. it hasn't come to pass yet, right? Uh, mm-hmm. But if if that's true, you mm. know that the Hurricanes are putting their chips in old players <laughs> over current yeah. players. You know, yeah. I find that extraordinary as well. Like, how yeah. could you how how could they see it fit to like destabilize their captain and their best player? And potentially a whole bunch of other players for the appointment of, you know, a, like a, a coach. Uh, like thinking about it rationally, he goes, "Yeah." The answer must be that like there is more money in the old players than the new player, like than the current players. Like there literally must be more um, corporate advantage in um, the hiring and association with Ricky Ponting and Justin Langer. Men of men of the greatest runs and safety in in our they want heaps know, Australian, of shit. Australian cricket DNA. There's there's more in, there's more profit in that than yeah. than current players. Uh, you know, like so so presumably, like you, if you're involved in the Hurricanes administration, you go well. Ponting and Langer are money. It's swingers. It's Vince Vaughn. You know, like they're money. Yep. There's that's that's eyeballs. That's sponsors. That's events. That's um, that's camera time that's exposure mm-hmm. for brands uh mm-hmm. and that's the hurricanes being the front and center story of the bbl um okay okay sure maybe four or five players want to leave <laughs> <laughs> sure but there'll be you know, other that's, players that's gonna happen with any coach we have yeah. great cricket yeah. uh yeah. you know we'll get a couple of guys in or whatever but how do uh, it, it it's i find if those things are true and they may they may not be um yeah but uh, you know there was a lot of acrimony in langer's departure from the australian team i think there was mm. a lot more acrimony than has been reported uh, it's amazing that like more has not like yeah. the players have not said anything it's amazing but, but h- how it will be like it, <laughs> If, if that comes to pass, that'll be a very interesting thing to watch, I, I reckon. It's, um, and just in terms of what it very, means. Yeah, sorry, man. It's very interesting in the sense of... Uh, the, the big, I mean, the Big Bash has got much bigger issues this year than ever before. Yep. The competition goes longer than the IPL. None of the test players play in it. There's a new South Africa T20 league. Now there's a UAE league on the same time. It's going to have more money involved in it. Matt Wade is one of the only world-class T20 cricketers that play in the Big Bash. And I yep. say that... I wouldn't have said that about Matt Wade um, two years, two, three mm-hmm. years ago. Matt Wade's literally just won the IPL. He's won the World Cup in the same 12-month window. He's one of the only world-class players that play in the Big Bash. And he might he might be shifting because uh, 
Uh, a new bike coming. Because of Gallipoli If that stuff. happens, if it happens, it might if it happen. Happens, it might happen. It happens. So. Yeah, you know, but like you, you know, the, um, at, at the UAE League and the South African tournament, so the UAE League has owners of the Mumbai Indians, Delhi, KKR, yeah. and Adani. Bit of bounce there. Uh, South African tournament, <laughs> Mumbai CSK, Delhi, Rajasthan have expressed interest in buying teams. Um, right. So this is per Dan Bredig's reporting. Respect Bredig. Uh, so he's talking about a couple of competitive competitor leagues now, in roughly the same window. With big old yep. budgets, probably half yep. the games. I reckon they might be in for some BBL teams. No, BBL players, sorry. Yeah. Um, or yeah. you could play 14 games in the BBL over like 10 months um, for like heaps less money. Yeah. Um, and heaps, heaps less of, money. Heaps and heaps less. of um, 100 hundreds and hill sprints and stuff. Um, or you could play for <laughs> Endeavour Hills, like Dale Miller. <laughs> India and South Africa is a series going on at the moment. At the same time, it's in India and South Africa are two one up in that five T twenty series. India are basically playing a B team. Heaps of guys aren't playing. Rishabh Punt is captain in the first T twenty though. India has kicked it off nicely. Got two hundred and eleven. South Africa chased that down three down uh, with five balls to spare. Van der Dusen at seventy five. David Miller is obviously just part of the Gujarat Titans who just won the IPL as well with Matt Wade sixty four not out in the second T twenty. India got 148 for six. South Africa got that six down with four balls to spare. Um, Klassen, who is also keeping in that game because de Kock, uh has missed that game with injury. He got 81 of 46. Um, South Africa doing some fucking, some real business here. Some real mm. business now. They played the third, T, they played the third, third T20i last night. Are they called T20Is? Am I, am I, am I fucking no, a relic good. by no, saying? I think you're good to go. Yeah, well, whatever. Good to go here, boys. On the way, lads. Uh, no Thirty twenty. Indy got one hundred and seventy nine uh, for five. Uh, both the openers, which were Guy Quad and uh, Ishan Kishan, um, opening up the top there. They both got fifties, and South Africa. Uh, South Africa finished like fifty runs short. So that's two one up. But uh, it's it's interesting. I mean, you, India are playing a B team. They're missing all all their regular players that you would recognise. Um, but it's still a fucking gun IPL team, uh, and South Africa doing. Sensationally well under there under uh, Bavuma as captain of that side, um, but uh, I mean it's it, it's actually quite a. Indi- I think India are actually supposed to be favourites. India are actually favourites. I think uh, going into this T Twenty World Cup in a few months' time, and there's lots of T Twenty cricket happening across the world at the moment. Um, I know uh, Afghanistan and Zimbabwe are playing some stuff as well at the same time. As Who would you as, have um, as favourites? Uh sorry, you know, we're not enough we're not in a fucking sports bet multi or some shit. Yeah, let's just No, no, no. I mean there th- I think th- the, the the three teams that play cricket will be will be there or thereabouts, I think. I think England will be good. <laughs> I think Australia will be good and I think India will, will be good, but India away from home. India India don't tend to win away from home. But all their players are fucking amazing and they've got like 80 of them. But then England have a decent bowling attack in Australia. And some of their batters, I think, might suit playing in Australia. But then Australia, uh, most of those guys are actually from Australia. And they grew up playing cricket in Australia. So that's good as well. Maybe Australia are favourites. I don't know. I think Australia are pretty good. I think Australia are pretty good. Who do you think? I think that, like, if, like, pound for pound, like, England should win the tournament. Do you? I, I think they're unders on, on their returns for um. I think I think if Joffrey was playing, I just feel better. For some reason, but yeah, yeah for sure. I, I just think but he's that, not. Like, if, I think if they're on, they're good to go. Yeah, I just the mm. problem is I, the, the thing I can't reconcile is like last year with the T Twenty World Cup in the UAE. Yeah, you know we were like, Australia's not going to get out of the group. Get out uh, of the group, yeah. And and they got a whole bunch of luck and ended up winning it. So they probably they were, they were you have to say they were better than what we gave them credit for. Uh, yeah, but had a whole bunch of luck. Problem is that like. I can't reconcile how, you know, poorly I viewed them last year, and then, and then see them twelve months later and go, yeah, no, they should win this now. That'd just be classic <laughs> Australian view, wouldn't it? But but Aussies in Australia, it's hard not, it's hard to go past it. Yeah, isn't it? yeah. So my team is playing in in my country. Well, they yeah. must win now. But that's 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 yeah. just a tribal thing, isn't it? Well, it's because they know how to get to the grounds. Like when the games at the Gabba, they sort of know where to park and then they know where to put their kit in the dressing and room. And do warm just up. Sort of familiarities there. Yeah, do a warm up. Be doing this yeah. part of the grounds. Do it under the right tree. Um, you know, like how to walk to the tea room to like get like a lamington mm. or something. Mm. So the, all those little advantages do add up in a in a mm. professional cricket tournament. Or like, a, like the the like the tea lady like knows 
how to get like Pat Cummins his favorite green cordial, and like then the opposition <laughs> comes in and like she's like, oh hey Pat, here you can have this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, and then she sort of says mean. like the other guys like, <laughs> like what, what 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 can I do for you? Uh, well, I'll tell you what Barbara Zam can do for Pakistan. Oh. Fucking hit bulk runs. How's yeah. that for a segue? Um, Pakistan beat West Indies 3-0 in the ODI series, obviously one of the great series. Um, Babra Zam's last seven ODI innings, Pez, 158, 57, 114, 105 red ink, 103, 77, one failure. Um, that's fucking amazing. That's so good. That's so good. Is he the best player in the world at the moment? Almost as though he can play. The guy can stick. The guy can stick. Um, hey, I'll tell you who else who can stick. Liam Limickson is coming up in a moment's time. But before we got to do that, Pez, we got to thank, got to thank. Oh, no, the answer to this. Smuggler. Oh, no, the, I thought the answer was Viacom 18 and Disney uh, for their $5.5 yeah, $5 billion dollar rights. Um, hey, nice catch. Nice catch. Was no, that, no, that is what we're talking about, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, no, Viacom's uh, Disney, if you're, if you're listening. Uh, yeah, the IPL rights went for five, five point whatever billion dollars uh, US and... Um, what else is there to say? He goes, uh, fair, Have a look bit at of, it. fair bit of coin there. Um, it'll go for longer eventually. There'll be more games eventually. That's built into it. Uh, there was three packages. It mm-hmm. was uh, it was the the Indian TV rights, subcontinent TV rights, subcontinent digital rights, and then the global rights. Uh, yeah. So Times Internet got the global rights. I don't know what that is, but if they want to talk to us as well, all good. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, it is the halving of the ownership of rights for Disney. So Disney used to have all of it, all a hot star. Yep. Um, yep. But, um, but yeah, Viacom's come in now. And uh, I don't know, man. Yep. It's, um, it's, that's just an absolute juggernaut of a thing. Uh, yeah, yeah. Christ I, um, alive. I, I don't... Most people who listen to this show are young of mind or at least heart. And so I don't think there's many people who will be watching this or listen to this and say, have conversations, you know, around the office or the water cooler um, and say things like, I just don't understand how guys cannot play for their team, their, their national side, and they choose the IPL. There's, there's so much money. There, it's, <laughs> it's so much money. It's, it's, um, so the, the, the rights of 5.1 billion, the per match value of an IPL game for the new right cycle has nearly doubled from what Star and Near paid in the 2018-22 cycle. So approximately 7.36 million per game for TV, approximately 6.4 million for digital. So across those two, that's 13, that's 13 point whatever. Um, to put that in the context, the Premier League, the English Premier League is um, 11 million, uh, 11 million per game. Um, so there's more money in the IPL than there is the English Premier League. Uh, probably don't really care too much about a bilateral series in Sri Lanka with respect to the beautiful people of Sri Lanka uh, who deserve who deserve more cricket and better lights and electricity and fuel. Uh, and those three um, things are often intertwined. Famously, yeah. It's mm. actually what I did a degree in. Twining. <laughs> Twining's tea. Bit of tea stuff there. Uh, anyway, yeah, so there's a bit of bunts there. Um, all right, uh, Pez, uh, before we get to Liam Limison, let's talk about Budgie Smuggler, uh, the most ordinary rig competition. We've had a couple of speak pipes come in to tell uh, the, the good people out there have uh, lend, us, lend us their thoughts uh, about their rigs. And shall we kick off straight away? Go for it. Obviously, oil will always be my favourite. But... Um, but gas, gas has a special place in my heart. <laughs> no, I'll see. No, <laughs> What the fuck is that? So, just to, so we've asked, we've asked for people's reflections on their own rig and what rigs mean to them. Yeah, yeah. And he says, uh, oil uh, is what? Uh, oil is one thing, but gas is close to my heart. A special place in my heart. Naughty. Maybe he's talking about oil rigs. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. Uh, and there's another one. He goes. Um. Oh, it's bad. 
kind of like hardened beef dripping suspended from a coat hanger but not a nice coat hanger one of those cheap thin plastic ones that you get from a low grade department store um relationship with rig estranged divorced <laughs> long nasty custody battle <laughs> which i am losing bmi has been above batting average for 11 years in a row um turning 31 this year too late for that to change really isn't it let's face it um it's not getting any better is it it's not going to get any better from there it's over got to accept it got to accept it got to accept it um well pez uh what are we talking about there I think thanks to everyone who wrote in with those speak pipes. It's all part of Budgie Smuggler's um, Ordinary Rig UK campaign uh, entrance. If you do want to enter, well, you can't. It's close. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, if you do want to check out people's entrance to um, to the Ordinary Rig campaign, go to hashtag Budgie Smuggler UK or at Budgie Smuggler UK or across social media. You're going to see some good shit there. Uh, the finale is in London, July 2. It's a Victoria's Secret meets Miss World style pageant. Uh, oh, yeah. And um, yeah, the the winner of the world's most, UK's most ordinary rig is going to get a 12 month modelling contract with Budgie Smuggler, a billboard in their hometown saying, Welcome to Town X, home to UK's most ordinary rig, an all expenses paid trip to Australia in 2023 to compete in the world's most ordinary rig. Oh, and a sash with the UK's most ordinary rig as well. Very prestigious. Very good, mate. Uh, very good. Liam Limmickson is right now. You're going to want to stick around for us, TDC, because there is another investigation about someone lying about playing club cricket. Here he is. Here's Livy. Right. Does anybody hit a bigger ball uh, than this bloke? It's an absolute pleasure to welcome a man who is pure levers, bat speed and sinew. Uh, he's probably the most exciting player in England at the moment, possibly the world. It's Liam Livingston. Livy, if I can call you that or if anyone calls you that, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you, mate. Uh, okay, look, Livy, and I like that sort of low tone that you've commenced with as well. Um, let's let's start with club cricket uh, and let's get straight into the sort of scenario that we all like to see. Um, we had a question come into us in late 2020. So this is a direct question from a young chap named Harry about a game he played against Nantwich in 2015. Am I saying that name right? Yeah, it's right. Nantwich? Yeah, I don't want to distract Nantwich. people. Nantwich. Nantwich, okay. No, it's so right. Nantwich... Nantwich scored 570 odd, and one player batting in a Lancashire helmet scored 350 in 138 <laughs> balls, consisting of 27 sixes. Harry was at school the next day when he gets a call from the chairman asking if he'd do an interview with the BBC. Um, Tom Holland, after seeing the result, tweeted Harry saying that he'd pray for him after seeing his figures. My question is simple How satisfying was it to absolutely pump Harry for 120 off nine overs on a Sunday? And uh, do you have a message for him and, and any other poor soul you've destroyed in club cricket? No, absolutely not. That was a that was a weird day. Um, I got dropped like three times on like 100, 120 or whatever. I think I tried to retire at one point as well, but the the um, the guy said that it wasn't allowed in the league or the cup or whatever we were playing in. They said you can't retire. So I was like, okay, well, I'll just try and head the ball six then. And, <laughs> then it just went from there. So it was it was pretty mad. It was a mad day. Um, and it's weird now because although it was only club cricket back then, wherever you go, I've just been to the IPL and do interviews there. And it's like, talk to us about that one time. And I'm like, oh. it was it was a Sunday league game in club yeah. cricket. Like yeah. I've done better, I've done better things in my career like throughout the last five, six, seven years. But everybody always <laughs> seems to go back to that day. So to be fair, I actually think it changed back. Uh, I think it gave me an opportunity. I think I was I don't think I was gonna play the T twenty blast that year. And I think that gave me um I don't know, a bit of a name for myself that our coach, who was actually Giles at the time, was like, let's go with him. So yeah, I actually reckon it probably um it gave me a little bit of a head start in my career that I probably wouldn't have got if I didn't score them runs that day. 
Well, mate, you're on the cutting edge of T20 cricket in the world at the moment. We've just seen in the last week or two, um, you know, Ricky Clark and Peter Trigo um, also announced on Twitter that they made double hundreds uh, in club cricket. Do you think they're possibly doing that to see if they could uh, earn the attention of the selectors again? Is that, is that what we're saying? Maybe. Maybe that's what they're doing. I actually seen it and they, they got quite a bit of stick for it, didn't they? And I don't really... Like, whenever I go back to club cricket, I get abused from ball one, and I'm so nervous. And honestly, I hate it. I hate going back because, I, thankfully, I haven't played in a couple of years, but you're just on a high... Unless you get 200, you're failing. So I remember I played a couple of games. I got caught square leg on, like, 20, and everyone was like, he's crap. Why is he playing? <laughs> and I, you just... Honestly, it's so hard to go back. I actually... I, the, the lower down the level of cricket I play, the more nervous I get. I would get way less <laughs> nervous playing for England than what I would going back into club cricket to play for Nantwich. So fair play to them lads. They're, they're going back in there. I don't know. I reckon it's cool for them lads to play against ex-pros or, um, yeah, ex-pros. That's what they are. So I reckon it should be cool. I did see they got a load of abuse for it. So I don't really know what's right and what's wrong. Um I, mate, I agree. Yeah. I think it's good to go back. I just think also, if you're going to tweet saying, I had a great day out with the lads, brackets, I made 200, you just got to expect <laughs> that people are going to write back to that. You know, that's just club cricket. Everyone's doing what they got to do, you know? Um, okay, I did, we'll keep I going. Didn't cause, see cause, that. Yeah, you, look, you've got, you've had, an, you've had, you've done more in your career than this, um, but I do have a few more club cricket ones. Um, this is another one from someone called Christian who wrote into us. I'm not making this up. Um, he says, as a teenager, Liam was on 98 not out with Barrow CC needing two or three to win when one of their semi-pros decided to launch five wides down leg. So I guess my question is, do you remember that? What would you say? Would you say that was in the spirit of the game or was it um, not in the spirit of the game? I was a 16-year-old kid, 15-year-old kid when that happened. Um, it was hilarious because I think it was my dad's birthday or something. So we had the whole family up at the cricket club. And, <laughs> yeah, I remember smacking it around a bit. And then this guy who came on to bowl, who'd never bowled, we needed two to any bowled this massive wide down leg. And I remember trying to chase after the ball, swinging my bat at it. <laughs> Obviously, it went for five wides. <laughs> and then there was absolute uproar at the cricket club. Um, but... Thankfully, what goes around comes around. And three, four years later, when I'd done all right, I got a message from the same cricket club saying, uh, hi, mate, are you available to sub pro on Sunday? And I was like, ha ha, ha ha, yeah, sure I am. Uh, needless to say, they, uh, they got the answer of, I will never play for you ever again. So, yeah, they needed, they needed a sub pro and I, I was available. I could have gone and played for them, but uh, unfortunately... As a human being, you remember things. Yeah, I like it. Uh, that must be satisfying, actually. I understand you also played a season of grade cricket in Perth in 2015-16 for Williton. Uh, and that's around the same time as you made 350 for Nantwich. So you're obviously seeing them well. So what, what Australians will want to know is, what grade did you start in? Is it the hardest cricket you've ever played to date, including international cricket? Uh, and can you confirm Cam Green dismissed you when he was 15 and on school holidays? Um, I actually started in the first grade and then we had Jack Brooks who plays at Somerset now. He came over, we were living together and they were like, lads, we can't play two in the first team. So I was like, looks like I'm preparing for an English summer of first class cricket in the second grade. So I had to drop <laughs> so down. So you played twos, I, okay. Yeah. I, played, I played twos for the last eight or 10 weeks. Um, yeah, I enjoyed myself. I loved it. I did horrendous. Honestly, I could not score a run. Um, I was trying to break into the, the first team at Lanx and I vaguely remember thinking there's actually no point going home. I'm never going to play cricket again. I'm useless. Um, I literally scored no runs. I was I think I ended up bowling seam because that's how bad I was. Um, but I had a great time. Um, I love the sort of the grade cricket, um, the World Cup that you play every weekend that them boys take it like. Um, I actually don't, I don't remember Greeny getting me out. I played with Greeny at the Scorchers actually. Um, but I definitely, I've, got, I don't I've seen the, I've me seen out. the scorecard. He was on no, school holidays. It was, it was a T20 some, game. Someone must have, someone must have edited it or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. I all right. Well, that, year that's a, that's a scandal. Um, we're just breaking here on the great cricketer. And, uh, 
I should also say there's a lot of people listening to you right now thinking, you know, they've also had the experience of playing grade cricket and never wanting to go on again, um, playing cricket, that is. Uh, so you've, you're in good company there. Uh, all right, look, you've had a good career since. Uh, since 2021, mate, uh, just going to read some numbers out to you. Uh, 65 innings, nearly 2,000 runs, um, averaging 34. This is in T20 cricket, striking 158, 134 sixes. You've picked up 37 wickets in that time. Um, you know, are you the best short form player in the world? Absolutely not. I don't know how I've got that many wickets either. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe I reckon, someone on Reddit was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> there must be 30 of them caught on the boundary, trust me. Um, no, I'm, I don't know. My career is, yeah, I've got better over the last 18, 24 months. Um, but I've, still travel around the world as I don't go into so the IPL I still go in as like I still feel like I'm a young kid and I know I'm not I'm 28 I'm getting on a bit trust me my body feels like I am as well but yeah I guess my my career has taken off I've developed um my game in different ways but I guess the biggest thing that I've done is just realizing the fact that if you can't score runs every day and you go out and just enjoy it, try and smack as many sixes as you can. And if you get out, it's all right. Cause you've got another game in three days time or whatever it is. And it was literally from that England series before the hundred last year, all the way through till now, I've just kind of rode a wave that, yeah, I like, I don't do, I don't do much net practice. I just try and go from game to game and, and keep that confidence. And uh, thankfully it's worked out really well for me. So God knows what I'm going to do if, if things start to go bad and I've got to start netting again. But um, yeah, it's it's been weird. It's it's almost like I've just played cricket constantly for the last 12 or 18 months and um, things have been going really well. So who knows, long may it continue. Um, but I'll tell you one thing. I'm actually playing with a guy at the moment at Lancashire and Tim David. He's got me covered. Are we talking about off the field there uh, or, so, or do you just mean on the field? I talk, he definitely hasn't got me covered off the field. His gears, his ugh, he's just a typical Aussie. Shocking gears, um, <laughs> shocking band. But on the field, Jesus. <laughs> I knew he was good, but he's, yeah, he surprised me a lot. So, he smacks it. Um, as we go to air last night, Langs had a great win in the Roses fixture against Yorkshire. We've seen some footage of it over here in Australia. Um, five to win from the last ball. There you are in Headingley, nearly clears the boundary, but the catch is taken by Tom Hartley. Absolute scenes. Headingley size was one. That, that's got to be a good song and a good circuit uh, for Lancashire. And, and yeah, I was going to ask about Tim David as well. I mean, you two in the same side. That's one of the great alpha showdowns I've, I could conceive of in world cricket at the moment. Yeah, that's the problem. I think it's, it's a proper alpha off. Um, we've only batted <laughs> once together, I think. It didn't last very long. I tried to bet for the sixth inning. So, um, yeah. Last night, uh, the other night, I can't even remember when it was, play that much cricket. Um, was on, It's always nice to go to Headingley. Um, I've never had so much abuse in my entire life. Um, and we were getting absolutely hammered. They were, I think they needed eight chasing 220. Um, one wicket down, they were cruising. And for them to uh, to bottle it was was pretty cool. So... It's always nice. I was filled in front of the Western Terrace as well. Uh, a few things whizzing past my head every now and then. A few mm. outrage, outrageous shouts from the crowd. So it was nice to just turn around and blow them a nice big kiss when we won. Um, just talking about the IPL, Liam. So, so you, you probably do hit the biggest ball in world cricket. I think a lot of people would say that. Uh, if we're honest, you know, that, that title is probably more important than anything Joe Root's done, you know, from a masculinity perspective. Uh, but you hit 117 metre six off Mo Shami a couple of weeks back. He's playing for Gujarat. You're playing for Punjab. Uh, Punjab, sorry. What, what's what's your regime for hitting a long ball? You know, like is it a combination of weights, plyometrics, elk meat? You know, meditation. Is it just a great stick, or or is it natural levers and just inbuilt fast twitch? You know, what, what what's the secret for all those listening out there? Thankfully, I've just got a very natural swing. Um, I don't spend too much time in the gym. I don't spend too much time concentrating about cricket off the field. Um, like I said, I go on the cricket pitch, try and smack as many six as I can. It's always nice when you get one out of the screws and you hit it miles. It, it always boosts your confidence a bit. So, yeah, it's um, I have no secret to it. Um, 
yeah, the, uh, unfortunately, um, I think you're either blessed with it or you're not. Um, trust me, some of the boys that, that I play with, we've been trying to get them to hit the ball further and it's just, it just doesn't work. You've either got it or you don't. So, um, yeah, I reckon uh, people like Tim David. He's, what, six foot four and he's he's a big boy. I think if you've got that, you're already halfway there. So, um, yeah, I guess it, the, the bigger you are, the, the more chance you've got of, of hitting a longer ball. But if you're five foot five, you you may as well just give up on the big sitting, big, uh, big six hitting competitions. I think. Um, just one on the on the on the BBL, Livy. Um, so there's a, there's now a comp in the UAE and South Africa. Um, we've enjoyed having you here in Australia. Um, you know, you 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 hit a big ball. You seem to get struck in the penis consistently as well. So that means you're on TV. Uh, but that that is sorry, I, I don't get joy out of that. By the way, I'm just saying you just you just get airtime. Um, that aside, like you know, your stars risen immens- immensely. COVID got in the way last year, and and now there's new comps popping up everywhere. Like like I'm not asking you f- to say where you're going to be playing or anything. If you want to, you can. But my question is more like, you know, what, what factors do you look at with a decision like that? Is it just, is it just, hey, show me the money, baby? You know, is it a good hotel we're staying at? Lifestyle? Or, you know, are you sitting down with the, with the owners and looking at the vision of the team? Is it just whatever your agent's saying? You're laughing at me as I'm asking these questions. You know, what, what, uh, have I embarrassed myself with this question? I mean, I think it speaks to the, you know, to the core of where World Cricket's going. Um. Yeah, there's there's numerous factors. Um, we've got to earn a living. Remember that. So that that's obviously a factor. That's the best way to put it, isn't it? Um, and yeah, we're. I guess the less cricket, the less time, the better. <laughs> yeah, but ob- it's true. But obviously, yeah, financially. Some leagues are better than others. Some leagues are financially worse than others and take longer. Um, and other factors such as, I don't know, say say there's a um, say there's a World Cup or a series in South Africa next year in the South Africa tournaments. Go in and go and try and get used to some South African conditions. Um, I don't know, some team may offer you two or three years of uh, just going somewhere yep. for one year. Um, I guess the biggest thing or the biggest problem I've got at the moment is making sure I've got the time off, which is mm-hmm. the biggest thing, is making sure there's enough time in the year to to get away from cricket because I've played way too much cricket over the last three years. Um, even now, coming back from the IPL that we've been in a bubble for three months, like, yeah, I've, I'm having a two-week break from cricket um, to make sure that I'm ready for um for the summer that we've we've got a lot of international cricket and then we go to Pakistan and then we go to the World Cup obviously in Australia so yeah it's making sure that you you kind of plan your year out to make sure that you're playing some good cricket you're playing in a good competitive um cricket environment um and yeah sometimes it's nice to go back to teams that you've played with already as well and I would love to go back at some point to play for Perth they were very good for me they sort of before I was, um, before I'd done much in world cricket, they they sort of put some faith in me and uh, give me an opportunity. So, at some point over the next couple of years, I would love to go back to Perth and play in a big bash. Um, I love my time over there. Australia is a great place to go and play. Um, not so much during COVID, but other times it was great fun. Um, so yeah, I guess it's all about making sure that that you're happy with where you're going and. Um, do you want to go and sit in a hotel room for two months um, yep. in certain places? Maybe not. Do you want to go to South Africa for four weeks and go and play six, seven, eight games of cricket and 13 rounds of golf? Then maybe that sounds quite appealing. So, yeah. Are you, yeah, saying, are you suggesting factors. you don't want to play 14 games for Perth Scorchers so and just really sink your teeth into the competition? maybe yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's I think it, it is it's one of the things now is I think the big bash is slightly too long um, yeah. but I guess it's like anything it's like any tournament I guess everybody's going to move with the times and maybe they'll um, shorten it and um, make it a little bit more accessible for, for overseas players to, to go and spend I think it's hard at the moment to for me to play I basically go from the white England's white ball summer straight into the 100, straight to Pakistan, straight to Australia to play some T20s, 
Then we play the World Cup. Then we've got ODIs after that. So for me to go then straight into a big bash for two months is pretty hard. Mm. Um, that would mean eight months solid cricket, which that's that's where the, the decisions come. So, um, yeah, I guess it's all about timing, which competitions fit in the right time around the international cricket. Um, and, yeah, at the end of the day, if you want to go somewhere, you go, you go and play in that tournament. Uh, I had a couple of questions on this, but I'm, I'm conscious of your time, Liam. Um, last, you know, on top of everything you've just said there, uh, I think last year you said your biggest goal was to play test cricket for your country. Just, you know, to, so just to factor that in as well, if you could just make yourself free for that, you know, it, like, is that still the case is my first question. And because you're in such demand with white ball cricket, would your advice to, given the way world cricket's going, would your advice to a younger Liam Livingston or another white ball dominant player who's young, would it be that, the most realistic path into the test side would be through white ball cricket. And how helpful is it that Rob Key would probably see you as a good style of a bloke as well? It's actually a very difficult question. And like, I want to play test cricket. Everybody's dream as a kid is to play test cricket, whether it's one test or whatever, I want to play test cricket. Um, that won't change until I've played a game. Um, but whether that's possible, I don't know. Um, mm. Am I going to be able to play 10 championship games in a summer to push my case for a, a test squad? Probably not. Um, becomes difficult because actually around the biggest thing about test cricket is probably mentally about being able to cope with the the um, the media, the, the outside sort of judgment from people. Um, and I guess you, you kind of experience these things more in white ball cricket because you go to an IPL and if you do bad, you've got, 500,000 Indians telling you you're useless. Um, so, but it, it works the other way that if you do really well, you've got millions of people telling you they're the best thing in the world. Um, and I guess they're, they're the sort of experiences and challenges that you've got more chance of, um, you, you've got more chance of experiencing them in an IPL than you have in the county championship. So it is, it's a, it's a weird thing. Um, my advice to be, to a young kid would be go out and, and, be yourself and whether that takes you down a white ball route, a red ball route, both, whatever it does, go out and be yourself. I've never shied away from being myself. It's probably bit me in the ass a couple of times, um, but it's got me to where I am today. And that's ultimately the, the most satisfying thing is you haven't changed who you are to, to get to where you wanted to get to. So um, yeah, I guess I, two, maybe two years ago, um, I had a decision to make whether to to try and really have a go at red ball cricket. I was doing really well, or to try and improve my white ball game to get into the World Cup squad last year and and go and travel the world and play in all these franchise tournaments. When it was difficult because you had to do fourteen days quarantine going into Australia, you had to do ten days quarantine going into India and stuff like that. So I made that decision. Thankfully, it's all worked out for me, and I, I got myself in that World Cup squad, which is which was the main aim. Um, but yeah, it's. It's, it's, it's a tough it's a tough call there's so much cricket now that you can there's so many routes to go down now maybe 10 years ago you had test cricket or you which was your big money earner or you could go and play um you could play white ball cricket for england and that was about it now we can go and play in eight tournaments a year six tournaments a year and earn a great living off it have a great time while we're doing it traveling the world so i guess they're the decisions that you've got to make and whichever is the best route for you will work out in the end, I guess. It's all going really well for you, Liam. Uh, you've got heaps of options because you're playing some outstanding cricket and it's really, uh, you know, it's a, it's just a, it's a big ball. It's a big ball and we like it. Um, mate, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, once again, I've taken more time than I promised you. Uh, so I really appreciate you okay. staying, mate. And um, all the best for Lancashire and the 15 other teams that you play for. And uh, <laughs> so we'll see you on TV soon. Hopefully. Thank you very much, mate. Thank you very much to Liam Livingston. Pez, uh, hashtag ICDC right around the corner, but Manscaped, it's that time of the week again to talk about Manscaped. Um, I don't know I don't know what we need to say about this product, except it just, it just fits right in the wheelhouse. I know that things have changed over the years with the showering policies of clubs, and that's actually for the better. Um, you know, uh, background checks of people, volunteers, uh, volunteering at clubs, getting the showers unnecessarily for no reason. They don't even really have any sort of role to play on a Saturday. Um, but if you are going to do that, <laughs> if you are, um, the, like the, the, the mothership of their offering is the lawnmower. 
They call it the lawn mower, like 4.0. That's, what call it. That's the thing that actually, sh- if you if you are new to it, 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 it shaves your pubic hair um, and it does it in a really safe and effective fashion. Um, I was walking uh, my dog this morning. That's not a euphemism. And I noticed some um, like council lawn mowers are actually using some like industrial grade hedge trimmers. To, yeah, sure. to, do you know what I mean? Um, to trim to trim lawn. Uh, mm. And I was, I don't, mate, is, is, is that, I mean, can anyone let me know out there? Like, uh, is that kind of, is that the best way to mow lawn these days if you have a really good hedge trimmer just to use that all across your lawn? I would have thought it'd be quite uneven. Um, yeah. And uh, an uneven situation. But that's what they were doing. So maybe people could let us know, like... <laughs> I can assure any purchaser of ma- of a Manscaped product will not be getting a hedge trimmer uh, of any description. Everything that you everything that you do vis a vis your pubic hair is even yep. and consistent, and and fr- mm. and it w- and it's your hair stays trimmed. You know, like the, how a ball stays ball. Uh, your hair stays trimmed for a long yep. time. Like it, it really works um, for quite a while. One of my favourite things about uh, sport in general in the UK is the verdant pastures of the outfield, the playing surface, the playing arena. Now, we see this all the time with, uh, with what the groundsman can do at, say, the King Power Stadium for, you know, lesser football clubs, um, you know, home ground there. With a great pattern on the, on the ground we've seen uh, in the grass, like cutting to the grass, you know what I mean? We've seen this uh, at um, St. James's Park as well there. I often see this in, like, in English cricket grounds as well, the eccentric circles around the, uh, around the ground for the outfield. A very nice pattern. I want to see maybe a bit of – I mean, I don't actually want to literally see it. Please don't – please don't send pictures of your penis into my direct messages. Okay? How many times do I have to say it? Hmm. I mean – If it if it's the right, I mean, if it's if, something if to it's, look at, I mean, if it's if it's, um, if it's something to look at, if if what, if what, if what, I mean, if what, if it's, yeah, I'll I'll I'll, I'll, I'll I mean, I'll have I mean, a look. <laughs> you appear to have. Developed a stutter. <laughs> How long could we have kept that going for? <laughs> okay, another ten minutes. Um, use the code TGC at checkout. You get twenty percent off and free shipping. Shipping is free. Not to be confused with great. That's a pretty good deal. Yes, that's right. Uh, or the free trade market, uh, which is what some golfers are saying that they're in uh, at the moment. Um, yeah. So uh, TGC at manscaped dot com. Twenty percent off, free shipping. Get your shit sorted. Get your junk sorted. Look good for summer. Look good for winter. Look good for yourself. That's not really a tagline, but it's something. Uh, hashtag RCGC this week. I'm looking forward to this one. Pez, do you want to read this or do you want me to? No, I'll read it. Go on. From Anon. Gents, love the podcast. Keep up the good work. My own grade cricket career was fairly forgettable. I played fours and fives for four seasons in Sydney grade cricket as a decidedly average all-rounder before I came to the conclusion that my talents lay elsewhere. In my case, that meant a career in the law, which is where this story begins. Dot, dot, dot. I was lucky enough to join one of the top Sydney law firms as a summer clerk, inverted commas, which basically means that for your final summer of uni, you are paid to work with the firm for 10 or so weeks and experience life as a junior lawyer, all while being wined and dined and whisked around to various fancy events. Brackets, it is not until later that you realise that as a junior lawyer, your life will be a succession of late nights and weekends doing grunt work, but that is a story for another podcast. These clerkships are coveted among law students, and once you secure one, it is almost a guarantee of a job offer once you graduate. The firm I joined had an annual tradition of a cricket match between the summer clerks versus the rest of the firm. Played on a synthetic wicket with a two-piece ball and mixed gender teams, it was a far cry from the glamour of playing lower-grade cricket away at Raby No. 2 in 40-degree heat, but a fun day nonetheless. In my summer clerk year, this event was a clear highlight for me, and arguably the highlight of my entire legal career. 
I was immediately able to claim alpha status among my peers by absolutely dominating. My seam up brisk medium pace had batsmen jumping and stumps flying, and while I had spent my grade career as a nerdling defensive batsman, I found myself walking down the pitch and dispatching all comers into the car park. I was quickly established as the firm's alpha cricketer. Fast forward a couple of years, I'm now a young associate at the firm, and the next crop of summer clerks have joined. At a welcome function for the newbies, someone introduced me to a young chap who I shall refer to as Pete, inverted commas, for the purposes of this story. Pete, they exclaim, is quite the cricketer. You should really meet him. I greeted him with a slight hint of suspicion <laughs> and, gently, <laughs> and gently inquired as to where he played. Ranwick Petersham, he said. My heart beat a little faster. This was a legit alpha club, at the time captained by Simon Kadich and boasting the likes of Nathan Horitz and a young Usman Khawaja in their lineup. What grade? First grade, came the reply. Wow, I said, while trying to remain <laughs> calm. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's a non that's weirder than him say you played first grade what grade you played first grade wow that's amazing that's amazing <laughs> in one moment my alphadom had been utterly extinguished if i was regarded as a cricketing superpower within the firm based on my humble skill set a legitimate first grader would surely be elevated to godlike status so I trudged off and spent the rest of the week quietly contemplating the end of my legal career. <laughs> Until that <laughs> Sunday, I found myself perusing the weekend newspapers. For context, this was the mid-2000s and the very early days of my cricket. So for most of us, the only way to, of finding reliable information on grade cricket was in the Sunday paper, which had full scorecards for first grade and short excerpts for the rest. I'm not sure what made me do it, but I scanned through the first grade scorecards until I found Ranwick to see how my new friend Pete had done that week. With some surprise, I could not find his name. Hmm. Interesting, <laughs> I thought. There must be an explanation. Perhaps I misheard him say Randwick. After painstakingly looking through all the other team sheets, I ruled that out. Well, I thought, perhaps he's played a few games in ones, but he's really a second grader. An exaggeration, but what grade cricketer would not be guilty of that from time to time? After scanning through the highlights of second grade, which only list out the names of people who score more than 30 or take three more wickets, however, I still could not locate him, nor did his name show up in any of the other lower grades. The following Monday, I gathered up two of my close friends at the firm and outlined the situation. Like good young lawyers, we considered the evidence, or lack thereof, and debated the possibilities. What if he's normally in the team but has an injury, one ventured? What if he's taking time off to focus on his legal career, said another. Fair points, we simply did not have enough information. I then conducted what could only be described as a thorough, all-consuming online research <laughs> project, i.e. stalking, to find out more. I plumbed the, de the depths of the then embryonic My Cricket. I combed through the Randy Pete's website. I googled all manner of combinations of Pete's name plus cricket. All blank, nothing. Speaking with the Brains Trust a few days later, we concluded that young Pete may not be all he appears to be. But what should be done? Confront him? No, too risky unless we were 100% sure. What we needed was to draw him out, force him to prolong the lie until he had irrefutable proof. Mm. So began the next phase of the campaign. I would look for any opportunity to cross paths with Pete and casually ask him who he was playing that weekend, how he did on Saturday, etc. Pretty soon our worst fears were confirmed. After telling me he hit 32 against Mossman that weekend, a quick check of the paper told me that the real Ramwick team was actually playing down in Sutherland without him. This went on for a week or two until oh. I realised that the annual firm <laughs> cricket match was coming up. Holy shit, I thought. I bet he doesn't know about that game. This is going to get very interesting. After discussing with my friends, we then raised the stakes. At my next chat with Pete, I casually mentioned to him the game and said how awesome it would be to have him playing, although it was sure to be a cakewalk for him. I saw a fleeting but unmistakable shadow flash over his eyes as he took in the news, but he quickly recovered and agreed that yes, it sounds like fun. As the days went on, I would constantly remind him about the game, and even at one point joked with him about getting Simon Kadich to show up. I'll admit I was having fun with the whole thing by now. Anyway, we got to the last week before the game, and the anticipation was building. At this point, it is literally all me and my circle of friends were talking about. 
I had even hit the nets a few times to make sure I was in top form to hopefully get one over this pretender to my throne. But young Pete had another twist in the tail for us. The Monday before the game, he showed up at work with a full plaster cast on his arm. <laughs> what happened? I asked him incredulously. Yeah, got hit by a bouncer on the weekend and broke my arm, he said. Won't be able to play in the game this week. Sorry. Unbelievable. The gall of this kid. I was gutted. He would have to he would get to save face and remain the cricketing alpha without having to prove himself on the field. I racked my brain trying to understand how he convinced a doctor to put a cast on his arm <laughs> if it wasn't really broken. Or had he broken it on purpose? With this guy anything was possible. So, resigned to defeat, I nonetheless showed up to the game that week to go through the motions as the now second best cricketer in the firm. However, this story was not quite over. As we were at the ground getting ready to start, who should show up but young Pete, cast and all? I'm just here to watch, he said. Emboldened, I figured we had one last roll of the dice. Once the game was underway, I sidled over to him. Come on, Pete, why don't you just have a bat, I said. Even one-handed, I'm sure he could dominate the likes of us. Amazingly, he took the bait and agreed. So the next thing I know, he's padded up with a ridiculous cast on his arm and brandishing a bat in his left. Time stood still as he took guard to face his first ball. We had bowling a 55-year-old partner who could barely get the ball down the other end at the time. As anyone who has played any level of grade cricket will know, a first-grade cricketer batting one-handed would still be able to decimate a rabble like that. So when he played the first ball with an awkward cross bat that, was, that barely made contact, a cross bat waft that barely made contact, I instantly knew that we had our man. His ungainly innings lasted around 10 minutes and mainly consisted of a combination of backyard hacks and air swings. By the end, my mates and I were literally rolling around on the ground laughing. Christ. At this point, one of the senior partners took us aside and demanded to know what the hell was going on. Oh, After looking gosh. at each other sheepishly, we came clean with the story. Right, he said, leave it with me. The following Monday, we learned that Pete was no longer with the firm. <laughs> Apparently, he had been hauled into a meeting with HR where they confronted him with his CV, which stated he was a first-grade cricketer and he was forced to admit it was not true. Apparently, they were prepared to look past that. However, it also came out that several other items on his CV were made up or embellished. Pete, it seems, did not limit his looseness with the truth to the cricket arena. A sad end to the story for young Pete. But before you start feeling too sorry for him, I did hear later on that he managed to move overseas and work as a lawyer. So my questions are, one, is this the first instance of someone losing their job over lying about grade cricket? Two, <laughs> did I do the right thing by dobbing him in and costing him his career in order to preserve my own alpha status? If so, why am I still troubled by the incident all these years later? Three, should this story convince all of us that rounding up a score of 28 to 30 odd and otherwise pumping up one's own stats is a dangerous slippery slope and should be discouraged? <laughs> Yours and non. Woo! Uh, well read, Sam Perry. Uh, I'm going to answer a non number two question. Did I do the right thing by dobbing him in uh, in order to preserve your own alpha status? No, absolutely not. That was That's your right. That was your want. It was your right. It was your need. And you did the right thing. This was basically catch me if you can, except twos. Yeah. Well, ones actually. <laughs> it was actually ones. Um, <laughs> and Pete is uh, a very poor man's Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, and a non is, I guess, Tom Hanks. Um, so is this the first instance of someone losing their job ever lying about great cricket? Hard to say, hard to say, but it does sort of bring into the, the third question here about lying generally in cricket here, where this is at the very nexus of newspapers, uh, print media dying and my cricket taking over. My cricket is the play cricket in Australian terms where of course you could lie and my cricket play cricket just took away the ability to lie because now, and now we look at like Frogbox and every game ever is now streamed online. There is no potential to lie or, or embellish hide. your stats at all or hide. You've got nowhere to hide these days. You know how easy it was to be Jack the Ripper in 1780, whatever the fuck? It's a bloke just killing some prostitutes. No danger of that doing it now. CCTV everywhere. And that's exactly the same as this. <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you didn't think I was going to invoke Jack the Ripper. <laughs> Look oh, great, he played. But hey, but hey, he, <laughs> he also said he made thirty odd fucking made a veil. He was up in Yorkshire, wasn't he? He was a Yorkie. Uh, yeah, it's, he, it's, it's more. It's more problems for that club. More problems yeah, for Yorkshire. Yeah, more problems for Yorkshire. <laughs> <laughs> Their problems go much further back. <laughs> much than further fucking back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Fucking yeah, hell. I was reading that. I'm like, I can't wait for him to bring out the Jack the Ripper Yorkshire stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, well, I get a bit um, like, I find I find this this um, story triggering in a in a way because quite clearly, um, Anon is a lawyer uh, because uh, it's a five page story. Uh, yeah, and, yeah, 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 and it's just like a conversation with my dad, <laughs> um, <laughs> who I love. <laughs> I was on the phone to my dad the other day, telling me about Qantas fucking him over, and he was basically running me through his like cross examination of some poor call center staffer. Um, and he was being nice to them, but he was like telling me that he was saying to them like, he's like, "Are you solemnly telling me that?" Uh, <laughs> you know, like, okay, dad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he's a he's a good man. Get off the back of my dad. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I guess like one thing that sticks out to me here is that this guy Pete uh, has, you know, what what this does show is that, and what it proves is what we've been trying to say for one hundred and ninety six podcast episodes and change, mm-hmm. which is that you know, early two thousands grade cricket had had weight. It meant something. Yeah. You know, and clearly because yeah. this because this master manipulator, pathological liar, Pete, he's mm-hmm. he saw it fit to include um, life as a first grade cricketer on his CV. He thought that was going to afford him some um, advantages in getting the the job that he yeah. wanted, and it did. It you know, did. like Pete, yeah. he actually had like senior staffers afraid for their identity. You know, that mm. is what the weight of a first grade cricketer was back in the day. That's right. Um, I don't know about now. I don't know about now um, yeah. so much. But um, so that's the first thing. Uh, and then uh, I, don't, I don't know, dude. Uh, I don't know after that. Um, I think you're right. Like I think Anon did exactly the right thing. Like I think Anon did exactly what he should have done. Uh, and um, he needed to defend his alpha status and his identity. And he did it. And he did it, um, he did it uh, methodically. And comprehensively, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm, I like, mean, the 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 balls of Pete to show up to the game, obviously what trying a to kind fucking of fucking idiot. But like to sort of hide in plain sight, you know. Oh no, he show like he's he's obviously sort of got a he's got brains enough. But uh, oh no, yeah. but then like when he got when he got the bat and tried bat left handed and could barely fucking waft the thing. Also, what about like what about having getting a cast on and and still having to be out for saying well it was actually a bumper that got me, so like you know yeah. sort of like like it's there's still it's he like a, it's like, a, it's like a quick bowler getting stressies still a bit of a badge of honour because you got to be quick enough to get a stressy you know what I mean yeah obviously they yeah, feel yeah, horrendous yeah. no one wishes a stress fracture on anyone but you know the no. longer you're out the faster you are coming six years he's quick <laughs> <laughs> kids quick. <laughs> Uh, he knew, like Pete knew enough. He knew like who was in the competition. So maybe he had like some. Maybe he went to like fucking. He had train on squad or some shit. But then, yeah, then the, he's got the, a nut, the, yeah. the stupidity of taking the bait. Like he would have looked at the partners by and be like, I can do something here. And still, like that's he was blinded. He he flew to the sun. He flew to starting the sun. In, starting in ones as well. That should, he just wanted he he wanted too much. He bit off too much too early because he Stupid. obviously un, he understood caution because that's why I said I made thirty two. Against Mossman, that's an interesting score to pull out, isn't it? Like yeah. it, it could be because he's he's lying, but he need, he mm. needs it in his head to be a believable lie. Yeah. You know, so at some point there's a score that he that he would lie about where he believes no, that's too much, that's too many runs, that's too but many runs for signifies. someone who doesn't play this competition at all. <laughs> you know. <laughs> But, but it's, like, it's a signifier yeah. that you can play the sport. If you can, if you can get to thirty, you can, you can score hundred. And thirty-two. So, so thirties. Obviously, that mm. sounds like made up too much. With thirties, the average. Yeah. So I'm just a tick over thirty. Thirty-two, a little even number there. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's interesting, isn't it? Forty mm. odds. Forty odd in grey cricket, as we've always said. Forty odds a good knock. Forty odd. You know, you've bought yourself a spot in the team. Best. Six games minimum. When it, when it hearts the summer, getting forty. Yeah. You can play if you if you make forty in first grade. You can play the game. You can play. The, yep. It's interesting, yeah, 30, 32. Not 100 for a guy that's lying. But what? Like, yeah. if you were him, you, you, wouldn't you have said twos and threes? Twos and threes. 
but he doesn't understand. I think I think if you've played grade cricket, you understand that that's still good. But yeah, but if you're outside of it, twos and threes might as well be fucking kindergarten cop. I mean, you, you might as well be absolutely nowhere. It needs <laughs> to be on. first grade. Hey, he did a really good job, Arnold Schwarzenegger, in that movie. <laughs> Okay, that was an unfair representation of Arnold Fuck, fuck that, that movie, movie scared me. <laughs> One of my uh, favourite bits is when he's asking them what they all, what their parents all do, um, what their parents all do for work, and like this kid gets up, and goes, "My mommy doesn't do anything since the crash." <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah. unfortunately for Pete, it all went Pete Tong. Uh, much the way, same did for New Zealand in this second test match on days uh, four and five. But hey, young Johnny Bairstow, he's, he's lit up the summer with that beautiful smile. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful, it's, it's, it's the face of a kid on an ice cream commercial. It's the body of an ox and it's the penis of a college swimmer trying to get into the women's division. And for all those wondering and asking, yes, another request was submitted. And yes, the bombers are grey. <laughs> <laughs> not even blue. Not even not blue. To, not, not to not Johnny. Not to Johnny. But the bomb, the bombers are grey. They're not even blue. It's a tough season for the bombers. Uh, all right, we'll see you guys next week. Uh, hashtag I said you see Friday is coming out, of course, on Friday at patreon.com forward slash great cricket. If you want more of this kind of stuff, otherwise, we'll see you next week. Cheers. <laughs>